evening. Good evening here to our guests at Europe House and to all those who are joining us online this evening. It is a pleasure to have an in-person event to mark International Women's Day. Today in the European Parliament in Strasbourg, President Metsola introduced the writer Oksana Jabushko with the words, on this day, the word celebration is not really a word we could use. In Ukraine, we see women are resisting, standing up and taking up arms against their aggressor. And reminded the house of the strength of Ukrainian women in the face of oppression. These brave and resilient women serve as an inspiration to us all as they defend the same European values that we hold. We are aware that everything else fades against this background. But it is also clear that sports and culture are eminently political, as the last days have shown. This year, we are proud to assemble a very distinguished panel to discuss the subject, which is not in the forefront of people's mind when they look at gender issues and the discrepancies and the discriminations women are still facing. We want to honor the pioneers of women's international football, discuss their groundbreaking achievements, but also the obstacles they faced and the challenges that professional women's football are still facing today. But before I will hand over to our very distinguished panel, as I said, will be chaired by Professor Jean Williams and is composed of no less than five former players who between themselves spun careers over many decades, um, Margaret Whitworth, Margaret Shepherd, Rose Riley, Carrie Davis, and Pia Sundberger, who is joining us this evening, or rather morning, where she is, Rio de Janeiro in Brazil. So you will all hear from them and about them more in a moment. But before handing over to Jean, who will guide us through the discussions, I have the pleasure to introduce you from Strasbourg, the MEP who is a member of the Committee on Culture and Sports, Tomasz Frankowski. Tomasz has been elected in 2019 on the Civic Platform Party. He's, he's a former professional football player and he is a, stri a striker with a very impressive uh, goal scoring um, record. Um, and he he is the Polish league's third highest all-time scorer. So he has played in France, in Spain, and also here in the UK. And he's also the co-chair of the sports group in the European Parliament. So we very much look forward to hearing from Tamás tonight. Thank you very much. So, hello everyone. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. I would like to thank uh, Professor Jean v Williams for the presentation. A big thank you for, to the organization for inviting me. I'm really honored to, to be today with you and to have a privilege to address some words from the European Parliament on this special occasion, International Women's Day. Dear ladies and gentlemen, I was lucky enough uh, to enjoy my professional football career, to represent my country and to play at club level across Europe and globally. And now, together with my colleagues in the European Parliament Sports Group and the Culture, Education, Health and Sports Committee, I am committed to developing European policies that uh, help sport in Europe grow stronger, more inclusive and accessible to all. The European Parliament has always been very active on achieving uh, equality between men and women and has a standing committee dedicated to women's rights and gender equality. I should say that every year Parliament marks International Women's Day on the week March and raises awareness by organizing events. I hope uh, that today we celebrate it not only on the plenary station in Strasbourg, where I'm actually but also at a global level. I would like to use this occasion to present my best wishes to all women and girls also present at today's event. 
Dear ladies and gentlemen, uh, equality between women and men is a fundamental principle of our union, enshrined in our treaties. It is something we have actively tried to achieve, most recently through the EU Gender Equality Strategy 2021-2025, where women and men, girls and boys, in all their di diversity, are free to pursue their chosen path in life have equal opportunities to thrive and can equally participate in and lead our European society. Sport should be no exception. Sport plays a fundamental role in our society. It helps us connect to each other. It forms communities and brings people together. It helps us strengthen our mental and physical health. All should have the opportunity to benefit for the benefits of sport women and men, girls and boys. Now, we are seeing more and more women and girls practicing sport. An unprecedented media attention on major events such as the Women's World Cup in France and a growing number of women talking to leadership position. Just look at the European Parliament and our new president, young ambitious leader, Roberta Metzola. However, we know we need to do more as she remains very much an exception. Women athletes, women coaches, leaders are changing the image of sport, making it more inclusive. They inspire fellow women to do the same. This is good for us as individuals, but also for the sport community. The promotion of gender equality in sport has a dual benefit. On the one hand, sport can contribute to the overall promotion of gender equality. On the other hand, more gender balance is beneficial for the sports sector itself. Dear friends of sport, as, my, uh, as you may have known, I was the EP reporter for the, a report on EU sport policy, which was adopted in November at the plenary session. This re resolution voted by a huge majority in the parliament is an important step for the development, development of EU sport policy in the years to come. With regard to women's sport, despite significant achievements, there is still an ongoing gender play gap in the practice of sport, as well as persistent gender balance and equality issues in the administration of sport. All institutions, sport federations and organizations must redouble their efforts in promoting women's sport and women in sport. That is why in this resolution, we call on the commission and the member states to involve all relevant stakeholders in ensuring that sport policy and legislation support gender equality with particular attention to tackling all forms of violence and harassment, gender stereotypes, low visibility and media coverage and disparities in wages, premium pay and awards. In my report, we also call on national sport federations to move towards equalizing premium payments for female and male athletes following the example of the Football Association of Ireland. In this regard, we are looking forward in the upcoming recommendations of the EU high level group, gender equality in sport, which should be published soon. Of course, my work on this report is not finished yet. I would even say that the most important part is coming now in terms of implementation. As the reporter, together with my colleagues on the Culture and Education Committee and EP Sports Group, we need to put pressure on the European Commission and Member States in order to see this recommendation put into force. To conclude, I would like to confirm that women can contribute to grade diversity in sport and combat gender stereotypes as they become role models, inspiring younger generations. Women's sports organizations also benefit from better participation of women and as athletes, coaches, of leading members of organizations. I wish you a good meeting and you can count on my support. Thank you very much.
Thank you for coming along tonight, everyone. Um, the panel that we're going to run is um, five people. So I'm first of all going to introduce you to, they don't like being called the two Margarets, but they are the two <laughs> Margarets, um, Whitworth and Shepherd from Manchester Corinthians. We're then going to go to Pia Sundhager um, because we want her to feel right at the heart of what we're doing tonight, although she's with us on Zoom. Um, and then we're going to talk to Kerry Davis and to Rose Riley. So we're going to ask players to give a, a little overview of their, um, of their careers. Um, before we do that, though, just to set up tonight's conversation, I think it's important to say that women's football is not new. Women's football culture is as old as football culture. So even going back to what we would think of as folk forms of football, which you probably know whichever area of the, of the UK that you're from, uh, or indeed across Europe, um, there have always been women who have taken part in those forms of folk, fo folk, excuse me, folk football. But in 1863, the Football Association formed uh, its laws of the game, the first rules, the first written codified rules uh, around football. And that actually started what we think of today as modern football. They were, however, a group of young men, um, Oxbridge educated young men, who were not interested in what women were doing. And they were not interested in facilitating women's football. So the reason that most people don't know this history is that actually women's football is developed as an unregulated form of the game. We do know of games of modern women's football going back to 1881, and there are images even before then. So one of the, uh, the things that I always like to address in meetings like this is the, the notion that women's football is somehow new or developing or progressing. Um, we know that you can't have a 150-year-old baby. So women's football is not in its childhood or adolescence or anything else. Um, it, it's actually um, quite a grand old dame, if she's anything. Um, and so thinking about that, then, what are the key points that, that I'd like people to know about in, say, a five-minute history of women's football? So we know the game's in 1881. Uh, we then have something like 160 matches played, 1894 to 1902. And actually, if you're looking for probably the first game of modern women's football that was played wherever you're from, it's probably in those 1894, 1895 matches. In 1902, the FA issued its first ruling on women's football because it had become very popular for women's teams to play against men's teams and the FA promptly banned that. Um, and the other thing about that is that women's football started as a professional entertainment. So the matches were played on um, major grounds and they were designed to draw large crowds. So again, I want to just address the notion, the myth that women's professional football is new. It isn't, and it has been around for, for well over a century. Uh, the games that you probably know about are during World War I, when women moved into munitions factories. And actually, women's football started as a kind of double war work. So as women moved into factories and uh, did the dirty and dangerous work in those factories of munitions, they then volunteered their time in the evenings and weekends to play football to raise money for charities. So it was a kind of double war work on the home front. Um, in reaction, the FA promptly banned women's football in 1921 with the expansion of the Football League to two divisions, um, one north and um, an additional one to the south. So it was really to protect those revenue streams why women's football was banned. But it was also said that women's football was an unsuitable game for women. And that really remains in the popular imagination. It's why we think it's a men's game and a game for boys. Um, that ban was to last for 50 years. And the brilliant thing about women is um, well-behaved women seldom make history. And so I'm going to introduce you tonight to some women who were not necessarily that well-behaved, <laughs> but um, did make history. So um, the team that 
the, Mar the two Margarets played for um, was Manchester Corinthians, formed in 1949 by Percy Ashley for his daughter. Mm -hmm. And there is a real European um, story to this in that they won a European championship in 1957 that was played in Germany. Um, the two Margarets are too young to have played in that game. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to ask them to talk a little bit about their career and how they started to play football and uh, where that took them. Right. Um, I started, I was 12 years of age and... Um, I just sat to go through a park near where I lived and I saw some women playing football and I thought, oh. Uh, so I had asked this chap and he said, oh, yes, he's manager. Only lives around the corner. So the next week uh, I went uh, to his house, had to fill a form in. My parents had to sign it. And that was it. And I, I joined the Corinthians. And then when I was 14, um, we went to uh, South America uh, for three months and uh, played in all the stadiums, uh, 65,000 people watching. And, um, and it was just amazing. And at 14, obviously, it's just something that you just can't comprehend. Uh, but when you look back, when you get older, you think how amazing it was. And then, obviously, we, we came back and we went to Italy. We spent three weeks there. Um, wasn't really what successful because women's football in Italy really hadn't taken off properly. Uh, but uh, we still managed to play a couple of games. And we came back from there and then we went to, um, I think it was Tunisia. From Tunisia, then we went to France and played a tournament there and um, won in Reims, a, a tournament in Reims against Juventus. And my career just blossomed Loved every minute of it, and I finished when I was about 27. I had an injury, so I couldn't play again. But I had a marvellous time, and I wouldn't change it for the world. Uh, too modest, Margaret. Who scored the winning goal in Italy? I don't know. Who was it? <laughs> I thought it was you. Oh, I don't know. I can't remember. <laughs> <laughs> So, Margaret, tell us a little bit about how you started to play and where that took you. Well, let's go back to when I was a child. Uh, if anybody's watched the recent Belfast film, then that was the era that I was kind of brought up. And them streets were the streets that I played in. But I didn't play with a pram and a doll. I played with the lads at football and cricket. So really, I was classed as a, what they call a tomboy. Uh, our girls' school, they only did netball. So it was quite surprising when I started work uh, in the civil service, and I, I played netball for the civil service. And uh, we were having a practice match. Uh, in the interval, the ball came along the floor, so what did I do? Kick it. Surprisingly, this other girl kicked it back to me. So we're having a kickabout. <laughs> and uh, she said, oh, do you play for a women's team? Oh, I said, no, women don't play football. I said, I play with the lads on, you know, on the field. Oh, she said, I play for a women's football team. It's called Corinthians. She said, why don't you come along? So that was it, wasn't it? And it just so happened she lived in the next town to where I lived. So that Sunday, on the bus into Manchester, another bus out of Manchester to Fog Lane, and I never looked back. I only did six years approximately, but they were the best six years of my life. Um, uh, I just loved playing football. It didn't matter to me at the time that the FA had banned us because we played on sports fields anywhere. We went to Reims and probably that was the highlight of my career because we, uh, we got to, to play Juventus in the final. And in the second half, it rained. So the Italians said, 
English weather. <laughs> anyway, we scored a goal, didn't we? So that was, that was it. We won the Reims tournament 1-0. And uh, it was absolutely fantastic. Uh, the Manchester Evening News was actually there when we arrived back, and it's the picture, um, to take photos of us uh, with the winning trophy. We did uh, obviously play all over um, the UK, uh, Scotland, Ireland, Wales, England, and we used to go to the what was called the Deal Tournament, um, and we won that twice. I suppose that was like a precursor for what is now the FA Cup, uh, like the Reims Tournament was a precursor for the Euros, uh, in a small way, but uh, I loved every single minute of my football. And the only thing was, I was too shy to tell anybody that I worked with, or anybody at all, that I actually played football, because it wasn't a woman's game. So, that's it. And, and just um, going back to this South American tour, um, ju just talk us through the logistics of, of the South American tour, because of, you glossed over it very quickly. You said we, we kind of went to South America well, for three months. Well, but just, <laughs> just give an idea of the scope of this uh, tour. We started off in uh, Venezuela and Caracas, um, stayed there probably about 10 days, played two matches against a team from Costa Rica, <coughs> and uh, we won the tournament there. And then we just traveled around the, through to Jamaica, from to Aruba, Curacao, for Paramaribo, everywhere. It was, it was just unbelievable. Um, and we played basically exhibition matches because we had two teams, Corinthians and the Nomads, which were all in one club. And we played exhibition games and he used to mix the teams up so they were quite equal. And uh, we used to play just, a, and we played for the Red Cross, um, which we raised, I think it was 12,000 pound uh, for the first game we played, which was a lot of money in 1960. So, um, Who paid your expenses? We had an agent called um, Viriato Cavaco, um, who was Portuguese, and he used to do all, the, um, all our tours that we went you on. Didn't have to raise the money. Nothing at all. Everything was paid for, yeah. So he used to organise the games. Then he'd go on, further on, organise the next one when we played that. And that's how he, he, he worked it. We should have only gone for six weeks originally, but um, it was so successful, they asked us to stay for three months. So uh, we were... Doing very oh, well. it was great. I didn't have to go to school. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. L lovely, thank you. And I know people will have more questions, but I do just want to... Um, Make, make the link to Pia, who I know is going to join us on Zoom. Um, hi, Pia. Hi, everybody. Hi. Hi. Do you want to talk us a little bit about your career as a player, Pia, and then um, what you're doing now? Well, first of all, I would say hello from Rio de Janeiro. Uh, thanks to football, I'm here. Uh, I just love to play football, even though uh, I was a girl back then, five, six years old, in a small village. And in, uh, now, football was something for boys and for men. But I had a, a great uh, parents. They allowed me to do whatever I wanted, if I was clean and if I uh, was happy. <laughs> and I had the neighbors around me, and um, uh, we played football, and I was the last from that little pitch, because I really love to kick that ball. I really love to, to compete. Uh, I thought I was a professional player when I was 10 years old, <laughs> even though there were no such a thing like uh, women's football when I grew up. Uh, and uh, I clearly remember when we changed from one village to another, a new school. And I uh, was shy. Uh, but I brought my football. Then I got some friends, and not only that, I had perfect grown-up people around me saying, you seem to like playing football. Yes, I do, but you're a girl. I think I am. 
but I, I still <laughs> like to play football. So the teacher actually allowed me to play when we have this uh, sports uh, to go with the boys. Uh, I'm um, 10, 11, 12 years old and I could play with the boys every time we have sports. And um, that is, um, I'm so grateful for this sport and um, the fact that I had said yes. Remember, I love my country, Sweden. I love my family. I don't want to go anywhere. But I've been all over the place because I want to follow the ball, the football. And um, in the very beginning, I never made any money, of course. But um, I made a lot of friends. And it's been uh, great to be fighting for my rights to play. And I've never been alone. I have people doing exactly the same as I've been doing, and together we are very, very strong. Uh, and um, so uh, sitting here in a great apartment in Rio, trying to qualify for the World Cup with Marta. Marta is one who plays in, in the squad. And um, it is just fantastic to listen to all football players like you are uh, and uh, saying that was the best time of my life and I'm, I'm, I live my dream right now and I've done all the time because I follow the ball, the football, it's my best friend <laughs> and uh, taught me a lot of things. Thank you Pia, um, I've, I've got Kerry Davis on the panel um, here um, and obviously you and Kerry have got a connection around 1984 um, for, for people who don't know, um, well, why, do, why don't you tell us, Kerry, what happened in 1984? So England qualified for the final of the European Championships and we played against Sweden in the final. Uh, in 1984, it was over two legs. Um, so Sweden won 1-0 in Sweden and Pierce scored the goal. It was a header. <laughs> Not happy about that. <laughs> <laughs> then um, the second leg was played in England. It was played at Luton Town. And I remember the day vividly because it had poured down with rain and they thought that the game wouldn't go ahead. Um, so we scored and we won 1-0. I think Linda Curl scored the goal. Uh, then it went to penalties and hey-ho, Pierce scored the winning penalty. <laughs> 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 so she broke our hearts. <laughs> and tell tell us a little bit more then, Pia, about how you moved from being a coach, uh, sorry, a player, to be, becoming a coach and, and where that's taking you. Because the, the theme of tonight is around movement and migration and you, you kind of embody that with your career. Well, uh, first of all, I said that I have uh, adults around me when I was a child, uh, and, and uh, not only my mom and dad, teachers and, you know, uh, neighbors and so on, and they allowed me to be different, uh, unique, and not like everybody else, and just go ahead as long as you, you, you do something that you really want to do. You have to work for it and, and you know, play this football. What happened was I was so interested, and I had good coaches as well, uh, listen, that is the key. They've been listening to what I have to say, and they have challenged me, and um, eventually, uh, when I was 21 years old, we have a big, big camp in Sweden for 15-year-old girls, uh, coming from all around Sweden, uh, 384 girls, and I was one of 12 coaches. And being able to, how I'll put it, to be a part of the women's development, the, the women's football development and improve, I was thrilled. I couldn't be in a better place. For one week in, in South of Sweden, and, and also I had the people around me, well, I, you're pretty good at this, but continue. So I was playing and I was coaching all the way till I was 36. Then uh, I had a knee, uh, wasn't that good. But after that, I continued, I worked for the Federation. And uh, then I said yes to um, coaching um, in the US when they started the professional league. 
So the key for me has been, I've said yes, but I don't know exactly what I said yes to. But eventually I just figured it out and uh, just try to go along with the answer. And I've been around, as long as I'm on the pitch, as long as I'm uh, around uh, football players or, or coaches, uh, I, I'm, I'm happy. And, and that's taken you to coaching Sweden, coaching a US women's national team, and now to coaching Brazil. Yes, and, and not only that, I've been in Norway uh, and in China as assistant coach uh, for uh, China national team uh, 2007. Uh, and I've had such a great, I remember when I was professional in Italy, sort of a professional. I wouldn't say that's professional because we just trained three times a week and I was desperate. This is not to be professional. Anyways, so um, uh, being in Italy, everything was different. I, I think that was my first thought, that was my first move abroad. And that was very important because I knew football is not playing the same way as we do in Sweden. It is different. To embrace the, the, the difference and, and that people actually are different, the, the, the coaching is different. And I learned so many things in, in, in Lazio, uh, which I brought to US. Uh, I was prepared for um, people are not like all the Swedes. People are different. And that's okay. Lovely, thank you. I'm going to move on now to um, Kerry Davis. And Kerry, could you talk to us about your um, career that led you to Italy? So I started playing football when I was a toddler. Um, I used to go everywhere with my brother. Uh, my sister was very girly girly. And the most I'd get my sister to play football was I, I used to bribe her with a packet of sweets to come and have a little kick about with me. But I used to go everywhere with my brother. And he knew somebody that um, played for a women's team. And he asked her if I could uh, go training with him. But I was too young. Then one day she came down and said that she would take me to training. So when I was 11, I joined Sandbatch Ladies, uh, so I was a little girl playing with a women's team because there was no uh, girls' teams uh, when I first started playing football. So um, I joined them, uh, made my debut against the local rivals. Um, I scored on my debut, but then the team we played, Foden's, they scored another 10 goals, so we lost the... <laughs> <laughs> They lost the, we lost the game. Um, then I joined um, Crew Ladies when I was 16 because they were a better team. And um, the manager there, John Fleet, he said that he could help me to develop and become perhaps an international player. Uh, that happened for me. I made my debut for England. Um, I scored two goals on my debut against Northern Ireland. Uh, the Italian connection came in with... I was away with England uh, at a tournament that the Italians used to hold, which was called the Mundialito. They had this annual tournament, and they would uh, the USA used to come along, Sweden, Norway, Germans. Um, we won the tournament, and it was uh, an Italian team like what they saw, and um, it was Lazio, so that's another connection I have with Pia. So as Pia left Lazio, I joined them the following year. Um, and that's how it started my Italian career. I played four years uh, in Italy. I played for Lazio one year, Trani two years, and I went to Napoli. And at Trani and Napoli, I played in the same team as Rose. Um, so I managed to play with one of the greatest players that have played the women's game. So very fortunate there. Uh, my England career um, was pretty good. Like I said, played in the European Championships um, in 1984. That was the first European Championships for the women's teams. Uh, I played in the World Cup, one World Cup, and I played in another three European Championships. Uh, played 82 times for England. I scored around 44 goals. And I was the top goal scorer up until, was it 2012, well, I think? Then um, 
Kelly Smith went past me, and just recently um, Ellen White. So I've now dropped down to third, but I'm, I'm not complaining because my goals per game is better than theirs. So <laughs> I'm, I'm hanging on to something, <laughs> just about. Um, so that was my career in five minutes. <laughs> Wonderful, thank you. Um, and, and Rose, can you tell us about your journey to, yeah, to first, Italy? Yeah, first of all, good evening to everybody. Uh, the two Margarets are absolutely amazing. <laughs> uh, Kerry it was one of the best, I think, English players of all time. And Pia, I remember when you played for Lazio and you were a good friend of Carolina Morace, who speaks very highly of you. Good girl. Um, my career, God knows. I started, um, I was six years of age and there was no women's team. I'm from Scotland, if you don't understand my accent. <laughs> I, I said, just a uh, bad luck for you. <laughs> um, anyway, uh, the local boys, the, co the local boys team coach from Stuart and my team in, in Scotland, he, he said, will you come and play with the boys team? And I said, of course. He said, but you'll need to cut your hair like a boy. Um, you'll need to change your name from Rose to Ross so that you can play in this league. And I said, no bother. Uh, went to the local barbers. I said, my mum said I've got a boy's haircut and she'll, she'll pay you after. Uh, which never happened. She nearly killed him. So uh, Rose became Ross and started playing with the boys team. Obviously, I couldn't get in the dressing rooms. I had to change at home with my football strip. Um, at a certain time, uh, there was a Celtic scout who was trying to pick up young boys for the Celtic boys team and I'd scored eight goals in this game. And he said, at half time, I want to sign the wee boy, Ross. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, the, the manager said, no, no, it's a, it's a girl. No, 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 the one that scored all the goals, <laughs> it's still a girl. <laughs> uh, and I was devastated uh, that I couldn't sign for Celtic men because I thought if I was good enough, it didn't matter about the gender. In the meantime, there was a women's team started in, in Stewarton, and um, it was like local ladies that were playing charity matches. Um, um, it, it wasn't a, a great level or whatever, but I, I said there's a women's team, so I, I, I went along and asked if I could play with them, and I was seven years of age. And the lady said, no, we don't, boys can't play. <laughs> And I said, so I already had gender issues, but I wasn't giving a shit. As long as I, I would have been a boy or a girl or whatever, just let me play. And she said, come back in two years' time. So I went back in two years and one minute later to join the, the ladies' team. Uh, from there, there was nothing happening in Scottish football, but I did play for my country. I played for Scotland against England, the first international women's game in Greenock in Scotland and uh, I scored the goal from a corner kick and it was like Scotland won, England nothing and I wanted the referee just to stop the game. <laughs> just to say Scotland beat England and Rose Riley scored the winner. <laughs> but that wasn't to be uh, the old enemy, who is England, by the way, um, won the game. Uh, after that, I was, in, um, I was also an athlete. I was a pentathlete and I, was, uh, I went to St Andrews University for... Um, for, uh, to train for the Commonwealth Games and I, get, I was getting picked for the Commonwealth Games and the coach said to me, you'll, not, you'll need to stop playing football, Rose, it's not good for athletics because you're, you're getting thigh muscles like football thighs, <laughs> not good for athletics. So I stopped um, playing football for a week. I had a career on the horizon for athletics, there was nothing for football and I gave up the athletics career for football. After uh, I got signed for Stade de Reims, I uh, went to the local newspaper and I asked them if they would sponsor me to go abroad, if there was any professional teams. And I went to Stade de Reims, um, where Anna Bryan was at the time. Signed on for Stade de Reims, and it lasted for about six months, and then AC Milan uh, bought me as a professional uh, footballer. I always remember I stayed in a hotel for the first time uh, uh, I, I didn't have a telephone at home. My, my, my parents didn't have a phone at home, so I used to speak to myself in a mirror at night <laughs> because my teammates didn't speak English, I didn't speak Italian. But it wasn't in a sad way, it was just a way of coping uh, and whatever. Then I learned Italian, whatever, and uh, 
went on from there. In the meantime, the SFA, the Scottish Football Association, banned me for life uh, because I'd went to play in Italy. I'd become professional. Um, so I said, oh, well, tough. There's nothing I can do about it. I, I, I never ever dwelled, dwelled on the, the, the low sides of anything that happened with me. Um, the Italians asked me if I would play for Italy, and I said, yeah. <laughs> uh, how's that going to happen? I said, OK, I'll agree. I uh, started playing for Italy, which I was very honoured to do. But um, we won the Mondialito. I think we beat England that year. I don't <laughs> think so, Rose. Do you not remember that? No, I no. <laughs> uh, anyway, and I went to a tournament in China, and I was uh, named the world's best female football in that particular time. And I thought, oh, that's not bad for a Scottish woman. The, the, a Scottish heart is beating under an Italian jersey. <laughs> it wasn't my, it, I didn't want to be banned from playing football, but um, that's the way things go. Uh, what else? Uh, I won eight Serie A titles, two Italian Cups, two Golden Boots, and there was a certain year I played for Lecce in the deep south of Italy. I played in the Saturday afternoon in the Italian League. Flew out to France in the Sunday morning, played in the Sunday evening, and then went back to Italy in the, the, the Tuesday morning to, to train with my Italian teammates. In the same year, I won the Italian League and the, the, the French League. <laughs> then I get banned for health and safety or some, <laughs> something. Um, but no, I've had a great, I've had a great career. <laughs> I played until I was 40. I realised my teammates, I looked like their mother and the referees. <laughs> and I said, Rose, you better get out of here, pal. <laughs> um, always I admired uh, somebody like Pia, who, who's a, 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 a mind-blowing coach. A, a, I'm not like you, Pia. I, I would be rubbish at coaching. I think you, you need to have a knack for that. Um, I would love to be like you and say that I'm a coach at, at your level, but I'm not. <laughs> That's about it. And uh, I'm now an unofficial ambassador, ambassador for women's football. Let's say small girls, football girls, because I think the only way to change, if we take it into primary schools, we have to get them young, at least eight years of age. And that's where the future is. That's my point of view. Fantastic. Thank Hello. you, everybody. Um, and just thinking about, before I open it up to questions, which I will in a few minutes, because um, I'm sure um, there are some great questions from the, from the floor. Uh, this panel is the pioneers who um, pioneered the future of women's football. So uh, Rose has given us some comments there about how she sees the future of women's football developing and, and how you'd like to see it developing. Anybody else on the panel like to make a few comments about where you think the women's game is now, how you'd like to see it develop in the future? I think yes, please. I think well, Rose is... Uh, <laughs> shall, shall we go with Pia first? Yeah, yeah, yeah go on. Yeah. Because I'm, I'm on the pitch and um, I've been around the world, as, as you know, and uh, now I'm in Brazil. I can tell you that the game, uh, it's, uh, it's developing, it's faster, the speed of play, smarter, because we are professional now. When I played, um, we, we didn't have that many good coaches and we didn't compete the same way you can do today. So you have uh, Brazilian players playing Arsenal. That is fantastic because when she comes and plays the national team, she has a Swedish coach, Jonas, and um, she has uh, different kinds of players around her. That is developing the game, which have happened in, in the men's game as well. So now it's happening in the women's game as well. Uh, and I think that is absolutely fantastic. What's not so good is Coming back to, to uh, Brazil, they have an old style, and I can feel like they have thrown back 10, 20 years how they deal with the women's football. Not the people. People love football. It doesn't matter. But when it comes to make uh, the right decision and so on, and ser take seriously on, on the women's game, I think Europe, US, they are way ahead of us. 
and uh, it feels like I've gone back, so I have to start to try it again with, uh, because I'm not fighting for myself. I'm fighting for the next generation. And uh, that's how I have so much energy and I, I really try to do the best uh, with the people uh, I'm working with. Uh, but the game is getting so much better than 1984. <laughs> so much better today. <laughs> Harry, you... um, what I'd like to see is um, the development of uh, female coaches and more opportunity for females um, to have a career after they've finished playing. And I think um, it has to be with the Football Association. They have to have... I think they've started doing it, but they have to have a stronger pathway uh, for the development of female coaches. And I think um, they've probably missed an opportunity of our generations uh, where 100% they would have had um, some great coaches. But that's past now. But I, I feel now they really need to um, develop more women and uh, make it so they have a career. It's hard work to do a full-time job, then try to do your coaching badges or be a player and play football and at the lower levels and have a full-time job. So I think better pathways for female coaches and players would be something I'd like to see. And, and Margaret Shepherd, I know you, you carried... You, you said no, you... I was just going to reiterate what Ross said about it. It, it, it should start at a really young age. Um, it is progressing slightly, but not as quickly as I would like. Uh, I mean, I've got um, three grandkids, and I could go and watch them play football. They're only young, but there is an opportunity for the girls to play. It is mainly males, uh, boys, that play, but there is that opportunity. And uh, at that young age, obviously, they all play together, boys, girls. Uh, but it's always um, male trainers. There's no women that take, take it up and say, right, let's get the girls involved. And it just seems widespread Every aspect of women's football needs to notch up um, at the young, you know, at uh, the grassroots level, straight up to the women's FA. It all needs to mm. step up. Because I, I know you um, created a team for a while, didn't you, when your daughter was young because yeah. you felt that there weren't enough opportunities yeah. for her. and yeah and therefore ran a team in your local community. Yeah, I did, and um, it was quite successful. Actually, it was, it was a good thing because um, there were kids there, girls there, that probably would have hung around street corners, um, getting up to no good. But I got them roughnecks, and I got them all together and they were an absolutely fantastic team and they'd do anything for me. And I was so proud of them. Um, I only wish I could have carried it on, but uh, obviously circumstances wouldn't allow it. Mm. Mm -hmm. And any co other comments you want to make, Rose, about the future of women's football and where you'd like to see it go? Yeah, uh, I think it should, um, it should change in the boardroom. The boardroom of any federation or any association, English, Brazil or wherever, Scotland. Um, we need women in the boardroom. We need um, where the decision making is made is always in the boardroom and it's always men making the decision. I would just like women to make decisions for women and not men making decisions for women. That's what I want. Any final comments? You? I think I've already said everything. No, I agree with everything they said, yeah. I mean, you know, we do need more women, um, coaches, and encouraging young girls today. I mean, it's amazing. It's a good sport. It's healthy. And it's... Uh, I just think it's really great for young girls today. And we should... I wish 
I'd have had this opportunity yeah. when mm. I was younger, yeah. where we had to hide. Mm. We yeah. didn't tell people we played football um, because we were too embarrassed. But today, it's, it's wonderful to see the young girls just playing and enjoying it. Yeah, we've got so much opportunity nowadays to, to what we had. Uh, as I say, we, we were kind of pariahs um, playing football. Um, but we didn't care ourselves because we played, we were playing football. We loved playing football. If we had a, a ball at our feet, that was it. Um, but the rest of society didn't agree. And uh, uh, as I say, you got called all things because you were a woman playing football, playing a man's game. And uh, I think this is why we zipped it and we never told anybody that we played football, which is such a shame. Um, and they've got so much opportunity nowadays that the kids, anybody can play football. So we need to expand it and get uh, women's FA behind uh, coaching, um, everything, every aspect of, of football. That's my view anyway. Okay, just before I open it to the floor, just, just um, tell me a, a little bit then, because we, we're thinking about movement and, and migration. Um, tell me about um, how the role football played in you getting your first passports. And, you know, some of you have said to me that you, you're not only the first person in your house to go o on the overseas tours that you went on, but that you were the first person in your street to oh, go. Yeah. Well, I, I, obviously, I was, I think, most 12 when I went to Holland. I mean, obviously, I didn't play in the, the team then because I was only very young. But uh, I had to save up, and it cost £17 for the flight and I did a paper round, and I had to save my money so I could go. We stayed in the Dutch girls' houses, so we didn't have to s sort of uh, pay that out. But um, it was um, everyone saying, oh, where's your, where's your daughter gone? And they said, oh, she's in Holland. Well, no one used to fly, you know. Everyone used to think, oh, she's gone on a plane, you know. <laughs> so, you know, it, it was just uh, unheard of then when I was a kid, you know. But, uh, and then when we went to South America, oh, everybody was asking, you know, where is she? Where's she gone? And all my father used to say to me, I mean, my father was hopeless. He, he, he didn't like football. And um, he said to me, you better bring me some lizards back. <laughs> because my father was a curator. He's reptiles and, and lizards. And that's all he could say. And when I come back, I brought him a dead one. <laughs> <laughs> oh, he was so upset. <laughs> Yeah, that's all he asked me. Will you bring me some lizards back? <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, that was, that was just part of it. It was just so funny. But in them days, it, yes, it was. To go abroad at that age, it was sort of un unheard of. And uh, had you travelled, Margaret, before you went abroad to play football? Oh, you yes, had, yeah. Yes, just, just the year before. Um, uh, I went to Spain with my workmates, <laughs> but then the year after I went to France. Well, no, no, it was a couple of years after that that I went to France. But yeah, um, getting a passport, it was a little card thing. Yeah, three pound. Uh, yeah, <laughs> a little card thing that he had stamped. Um, and uh, it was, well, it's one of them rare things to go on a plane in our day. Uh, it was quite important. In fact, it was quite important when I started working. I went to work in Manchester, which was, <laughs> which was a big city. So to go on a plane was just incredible. So, but uh, that was it. As I said, there were little, little passports. Yeah, you had to put how much you were taking out of the country, yeah, and I yeah, took three yeah. pound with me for two weeks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, three pound. You were only allowed so much. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And obviously, we know Kerry. You you worked in in Italy, didn't you? And played in played in Italy mm. as well. I think most of the travelling that I've done in my life is connected with um, football. Yeah, yeah. 
And Rose, of course, you learnt the language, didn't you? you yeah, um, obviously, if you when you're in Rome, you do the Romans. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Never such in a good way sometimes, but anyway. <laughs> no, I was only 15 and there was two Scottish um, teams, uh, women's teams get invited to Morocco for an exhibition ma matches because the Moroccan, um, it didn't exist women's football in Morocco. So um, it was Western United, my local team, Stuart, and off we went to Morocco. That was my first passport. And uh, it was just males that were at the game. The stadiums were absolutely full. And um, I don't know if they came just because we were shorts on or we were good at football at the time, um, but it was, uh, it was a surreal occasion because there, were, there was no women there at mm -hmm. the stadium, but we, it was a kind of exhibition match. But um, yeah, that was my first time abroad, my first passport. Mm -hmm. Then my love affair um, started with Italy, um, and that's about it. Yep, back in Scotland. And now I'm getting acclaimed by Use English, lovely English people. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I actually got an award with an MBE last month from Princess Anne, which Yay. I'm very honoured. Uh, I've, I've started to get big-headed in my old age, you know what I mean? <laughs> Before you don't say anything, you can say, oh, no, no, it doesn't matter. Well, it does. <laughs> because we are the pioneers. <laughs> is, that, is that true, Pia? We are the ones. Yeah. The, the women's football now are standing on the shoulders of giants, and that's <laughs> us. I quite agree. <laughs> <laughs> um, and on that note, I think we'll open it to questions. Well, yeah, we played in a, a, a Fogline Park. Park and Park uh, and we, we had these dressing rooms, there was no lights in them or anything. And, um, and then when you played the, the, the match, you had to wash in the duck pond. <laughs> so, and then it was frozen over, you had to break the ice on it there so you could have a wash. Mm. So these were sort of things that you just put up with and it, it was fun, I mean, it didn't yeah. bother us any. Oh, we used to go on just full of mud on yeah. the bus, full of mud. Yeah. Yeah, no lights, no water, um, muddy pitch. Oh, pitches are awful. <laughs> Terrible. Like a ploughed field, and that's, that's what we played on. <laughs> but uh, I'd love to play on one of the pitches that these uh, youngsters play on now. Yeah. These uh, professionals. Like carpets. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, precisely, yeah. Mm. Uh, as I say, you know, we were banned from FA grounds, so what did you do? You played on sports fields, Perhaps. wherever they were. Um, and uh, some of them was really bad. Uh, but yeah, you played in mud. Um, I used to go home on the bus absolutely covered in mud. That was it. You did it because you love playing football. Um, and uh, as I said, no showers. No, oh, that was a luxury <laughs> if you got a shower. So. Um, the luxury to have a dressing room. It was. Yes. Mm, yeah. 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 So, you know, I mean, you had to take your own um, bottle of water if you wanted to drink after you'd had a game. Uh, so I would just love the present day footballers to just go back to our time to play on our grounds and to come back and say, oh yeah, I want to carry on playing football. <laughs> <laughs> uh, because that was dedication, dedication from all of us on, on here. And uh, as I say, we didn't, we didn't think about FA bands. That wasn't uh, a point at all. What we wanted to do was play football. We'd play anywhere. We didn't get paid. We just loved playing football. But as I say, I would love this 
generation to come and play on our football pitches in our little sheds where we got changed. They won't survive. And, <laughs> and say, yeah. oh yes, I want to play football. <laughs> no. No, they wouldn't. But uh, as I said, things have changed, things have progressed, and all for the better. I've been told we've got microphones for questions, so if you just want to um, wave your hand, then I can get a microphone to you. Yeah. Well, congratulations for being the pioneer of football. I'm like you, I played with the boys growing up. Yeah. What I wanted to say, in, in the US now, they just approved that the women's football player will be on equal pay with the men's football player. Do you think that's something which could come in Europe too, and UK? Um, <laughs> no, I don't, me personally don't think they're of the standard of the men yet. Um, and obviously, that is um, shown in the wage structure that they get. But who knows? Keep progressing. Wages keep going up, and maybe they'll reach the men's one day, but not at the moment. Excuse me, I think that the, it's equal pay, the USA, the Americans, um, just to play with the national team. It's not equal pay as professional footballers. As in the, the, the teams, it's, it's equal pay for turning up for your, for being selected with your national teams. That's the difference. And I think also the American women have got a good bargaining tool because yeah. they're extremely yeah. successful. Yeah, they are. Uh, they've yeah. won. Yeah, yeah. yeah, the men have not won anything. Yeah. So I think that's, <laughs> <laughs> well, it's true. I mean, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, you know, I think the women, how many World Cups? Yeah. Yeah, two or three yeah, yeah. Olympic yeah. goals. Um, so they've got a good bargaining tool there. Where um, I don't, I, I can't see it happening here. And also, I think um, the men they get thousands and thousands of people watching them. So it's a good investment for companies until the women's game grows uh, and it's sustainable by itself. I, I honestly don't think that they will get equal pay. I mean, the pay for the women footballers, it'll go up, mm -hmm. but I, equal pay, probably not in my life. No, no, I don't think so. No, I don't think so. Could I ask Pia a question? Pia, did you ever get banned like us British women? <laughs> we're, we're, all, we're all terrorists, we get banned. <laughs> what about you, darling? Did you get banned from actually playing the beautiful game? Yeah, no, well, yeah, as the people looking around, they probably say that uh, girls shouldn't play football. Yeah. And in Sweden, that they were forced actually to bring her up in a federation, and that was 1971. Good. Uh, Sweden played the first um, international game against Finland in 1973. Uh -huh. Because I've heard all my life, like, uh, first of all, now women doesn't want to play football. And mm -hmm. then we just grow and you become all uh, like a, a people movement. And then yeah. they said, well, you know what, it's dangerous. Uh, so they came up with, well, for, for, for your body, for your knee, for your breast, mm -hmm. or whatever. But they didn't have any research behind those arguments. Yeah, okay. And then they said, well, you're not good enough. So. Uh, I've gone through all these uh, comments, mm. and uh, when you say it's not good enough, uh, who uh, who is responsible for that kind of comment? Well, it depends on if you, uh, you know, what kind of person you are, and what kind of football you like, and we always had to admit that um, the women's football has improved tremendously. So people want excitement. Just watch the the fight of 2019. Uh, or uh, look at Barcelona today. Mm -hmm. They play such a great football. Mm -hmm. and, yeah, um, so we just have to uh, continue and, um, and talk about money. This is something I have, I think it's difficult because uh, in the Federation you talk about the bonus. Mm -hmm. And I go away from that uh, conversation all the time because I was not allowed to play football. Yeah. So I have that in my body, in my mind, and, you know, I'm so grateful that we actually have a federation and we have games and so on. 
And if I would uh, have a chance to decide what to do with all this money, I would put it down to grassroots. I don't think any of the yeah. national teams or coaches should have any bonus. Yeah. I think they go straight to the grassroots, mm -hmm. to the girls and the boys, so we get better fields, we get better coaches and mm -hmm. so on. So I don't like the, the, the conversation about uh, Slatan Ibrahimovic mm -hmm. and Lotta Khelin. Mm -hmm. Uh, should Lotta Khelin make as much money as Slatan? And mm -hmm. uh, right now, I think the question is just awful. I don't think Slatan is making too much money to begin with. Uh -huh. And then you have the marketing, <laughs> as you said. Uh, I can you know, see that. So I can see that you like him. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so it, it's, it's complicated, but it's the, the, the marketing, they, uh, you know, Slatan is more uh, valuable than Lota Khali. We, that's the case, because more people want to, to watch uh, Ibrahim. So uh, that's uh, another story. But when it comes to federation, mm -hmm. uh, you could actually have equal pay. And you're absolutely right about the U.S. They were winning, and the men is not winning at all. So. Yeah. Okay. Mm. Yeah, just just on the way to you. Yeah. <coughs> Hi, uh, question for the panel: Is the time right now for the uh, elite women to start playing on the on the bigger on the bigger pitches, bigger grounds? Well, uh, I think uh, you take Manchester City for example. Their pitch is, is superb. Uh, no, it's not where the men play, but it's as, it's not quite as big, but it's it's as good. Um, and I think other top class teams could um, take a leaf out of City's book and get them. I mean, United play in Lee my own time, well, near my own time. Why can't they play at Old Trafford? Uh, there's no reason why they shouldn't. They have a, probably a couple of games um, in the season where they will play uh, at Old Trafford, but why can't they play there all the time? Or oh, certainly on bigger grounds. And uh, I think they should do. Don't you need yeah. You've yeah. Got, you've got to get the people yeah. in the ground. Yeah. 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 Meet the cost. Yeah. Mm. Mm. Yeah. I mean, it would be a huge cost. Yeah. And if you don't get the people through the turnstiles, then you're not going to pay. Well, perhaps they would do if uh, they were at Old Trafford instead of Lee Sports Village. Well, they've done the odd, odd one, haven't they? They've had weekends mm. from mm. Super League mm. when they had played. Because mm. I remember going to a game at Anfield. Mm. Mm. I think they have to pick the, the times yeah. when. The yeah. Time. yeah. Yeah. When there's no men's football around, because um, I think Spurs did it and Arsenal did it, didn't no, they? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. 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 Well, they did uh, City United, and they got thirty-three thousand. Mm. Yeah. Um, that was the first you do time. Need good yeah, you do. Well, I think I think the women deserve to play in a, a good stadium. They deserve that. But um, what you just said there, Pat, there's a lot of different things, logistics, mm. to make that successful. I think it's worth reminding people of the so-called unofficial 1970 and 1971 mm. Mm. World Cups in Italy and in Mexico. And we know that if you sell women's World Cups as big, ambitious sporting spectacles, that you know you're gonna you could get crowds in the Azteca of 110,000. Um, so no FIFA World Cup has ever managed to match that. Um, so I think a leaf can be taken out of the history of the women's game. And of course we know during World War One that week in week out matches were selling out. Um, you know 45,000, 25,000. So I think it's the way in which it's sold. I think we've got to stop mm. selling women's sport like it's eating your greens. Yeah. You know, that it's yeah. somehow yeah. worthy. Yeah. Uh, we don't mm. watch sport because it's worthy. During, during we, wartime, it was very much a case that the men weren't there. No, that, the women were providing no, football entertainment. That, that's mm. not true, actually. The matches increased in number after the war finished. So that argument 
doesn't really um, go forward. But I'm just saying that if you frame it as big and exciting and something that people want to buy into, then people buy into it. And yeah. I think we saw that around the 2012 mm. Olympic Games. Yeah. I think that the only way to go forward with that is if, if all the teams are professional, super professional. I think uh, women's football are still it's still growing. Uh, I think we should have smaller stadiums where it's more compact. Um, women's football, it's like planting a big tree without without the roots. The tree is just going to fall down. But if we've got the roots mm. and, 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 and let it grow, I don't mean gradually, but let it grow, then we can become bigger. Uh, but I think the women's game in this particular time, smaller stadiums, mm. compact crowd, crowds, uh, obviously um, big international matches or cup finals or whatever, uh, we should be accommodated in the bigger stadiums, but I don't think we're ready for that now, just now. Mm -hmm. Hi, I'm, I'm sitting here listening to all your stories, being really inspired and thinking how many more people should hear from you and hear your stories um, and that you've still got a lot to offer um, women's football and the growth of the game. Have any of you thought about putting your boots back on with the opportunities oh. now that there are for women to play with recreational football and walking football? You can't walk on two legs, never mind. <laughs> <laughs> I my think you'd just be so inspiring <laughs> to see you, my you know, back out there. standing on. <laughs> That's it at the moment. Um... If it was 50 oh. years younger, yes, maybe. I, I would love to do it, but my knees won't allow it. Oh. So, um, I, I, obviously, that's all the <laughs> wear and tear over the years of playing football. And, I mean, now, there again, they have proper treatment. If they have injuries, uh, it seemed to. Uh, no. We had dead legs. Um, we're a bit older than these two here. <laughs> a bit. <laughs> I think uh, too much love and respect for the game. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Southampton, which was preeminent in the 70s, um, the, some of those players are still doing walking football. Oh, they do at City, yeah. 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 You have, um, oh, yeah, they, there's we plenty of people. teams around. And I have to have a walking stick if I did that. Mm -hmm. No. No, I'd love to have done it, yeah, I mean, definitely, but uh, not now. I've got an eight-year-old grandson who says, come on, Mum, uh, Grandma, do a kickabout. <laughs> she can't walk on one leg. No. <laughs> <laughs> so, no, I, up here, yes, <laughs> down here. Well, no. Yes, but actually, I just love to kick that ball. So sometimes mm. when uh, we have some, you know, have training with the Brazilians, I kick, you know, serve the ball into the box. Mm. Uh, that's something I will do all the time. Mm. Uh, and um, I don't have to warm up. Everybody has to warm up, but I don't. I don't need <laughs> uh, just kick the ball, play it in the box. How it could be? <laughs> but we have here in Brazil something called futmesa. You play two and two with a, the table, to, like your uh, table tennis. It's so much fun. Yeah. Mm. Sounds it. Mm. You found at home in Brazil, Pia. Pia <laughs> casa tua in Brazil. I don't think she heard you. I said, you sound at home in Brazil. Sempre a casa tua in Brazil. Uh, <laughs> it's, I, I really like the place because I'm breathing football, yes. people are kind, yes. and uh, you know, I'm living next to the, the Praia and uh, people play football, right. uh, football okay. and you know, it, it's like uh, contagious. So I've I ended my career, I think, at the right place. Because okay. probably this is the last thing I'm going to do. Pia, so. as a Scottish woman and a British What's the weather like? <laughs> <laughs> I think it's 30 degrees right now, maybe 32. Oh, or something I like hate that. you. <laughs> it's, it's pretty, it's pretty nice. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I think that's a good note on which to um, end it then, with some sunshine um, and thinking about the future. So. Um, I'd like everybody to join me in thanking our panel 
of, of speakers tonight and uh, hope you join me in a round of applause. Thank you.